Hi, good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Projectors uh, Facebook Live session. Uh, we are back in virtually today uh, to talk with Matt Green, who uh, stars or he's the walker in The World Before Your Feet, uh, which is a documentary that we are screening at the Projector Cinema now as part of the Architecture uh, Film Festival. Uh, we do have one more screening that's available. That's on the 10th of October. Uh, we've just added seats, so great news uh, as of today. The red room and green room, uh, sorry, red room and green room can take uh, 80 packs, uh, more than the 50 packs that we've been doing since reopening. So we do have added seats. If uh, you have seen some seats, uh, some shows that were sold out previously, do check back the website, theprojector.sg, and uh, go ahead and buy it before it sells out. It's uh, pretty easy to sell out 80 seats, so don't miss out on that. Um, yeah, and next, uh, this month, we are actually releasing a few films. Uh, Last Letter opens today. Uh, and next week, we will open St. Francis, uh, which was uh, the audience and jury award winner at uh, South by Southwest. And we have a special uh, screening of On the Rocks that will last for about two weeks from the 9th of October. That's the uh, A24 film uh, that uh, they partnered with Apple. Uh, so that, that will be in cinemas at the projector uh, for about two weeks before it goes onto Apple TV. Uh, check our website. Uh, tickets should be live by this weekend, and they should go pretty fast, too. But for today, we're here with uh, Matt Green. I'll be bringing him on shortly. Um, and just to remind those who are joining us now, this is uh, a chat with Matt Green, who is uh, featured in the documentary The World Before Your Feet, currently showing at the projector as uh, part of Archifest 2020. Hey, Matt. Hello. Hi. Good, good to <laughs> be here. Thanks. Uh, thanks for doing this on a you know early morning wherever sure. you are. <laughs> sure. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So I mean, uh, Matt, maybe you can just give us a background into this whole uh, you know mission that you had about walking every pathway and every street in New York, which really amounted to about 8,000 miles. And uh, you know how how you came about that? Like, yeah. Um, so it all started about um, I guess almost at this point it's been over eight years. Um, and so I had uh, you know I I had had a fairly normal life um, for the first thirty or so years of my life, and I was working as a civil engineer, sitting at a desk, um, you know, working at a computer every day, and. Um, I had just come to realize that, you know, it wasn't a bad job or anything that I had, but it right. just wasn't the life for me. Um, and so I eventually quit that job. And um, as you learn a little bit in the film, I did a, a walk across America first. So, you know, kind of long straight line through a lot right. of very rural areas. Um, yes. And then so I, for, those, yeah. for those who haven't watched it, this was a walk from Rockaway Beach, New York to Rockaway Beach, Oregon, which somehow was a straight line right across <laughs> America. So, <laughs> I mean, yeah. did, did you find out about Rockaway Beach, Oregon before deciding on this? <laughs> um, I knew, so I was living in New York already at that time. Right. And um, I knew I wanted to leave from Rockaway Beach, New York, because that's like our big beach out on the open ocean in New York City. <laughs> so I knew that's where I wanted to start. And um, I was just trying to figure out where to go on the Pacific Ocean. And I was looking at a map of Washington and Oregon, our states out there. And I saw there was a Rockaway Beach in Oregon. So it just, I right. felt like, okay, that's, the decision's been made. That's where I'm going. <laughs> and then oh, I just yeah. followed like internet walking directions to get there rather than trying to pick out a route. Um, so that was kind of a cool way of just taking all the decisions out of my hands and just focusing right. on on walking and seeing what was around me wherever I was. And and how long did that take you? That took five months. Right. Um, okay. So, so I did that a lot shorter than walking within New York City. <laughs> yeah, that's an amazing thing that um <laughs> and so in New York, uh, you know, as as the film ends, um, you know, getting close to the end of the walk. Um but it's there have been more extra miles than I thought there would be, which has been the case really all the way through. So um, there's still a little bit left to do. And I've walked over 9000 miles now. Um, so, yeah, it's been essentially three times the length of my walk across America, all inside New York City, which is kind of hard right. to fathom. 
and obviously years longer. Um, yeah. So that really gives you a sense of how immense New York City is and how dense it is. And a lot of that, the reason it takes so long is that it just takes such a long time to think about what you're seeing and to research it. You know, I end up reading a lot about the places that I'm seeing more and more so as the years go on. So now I'll spend a day walking and the next week just reading about things that I saw right. and learning about them. Um, so okay. it's really stretched out the timeline a lot just because of how how dense New York is, not just in terms of population, but in terms of history and culture and just everything is so jammed in to, to the tiniest mm -hmm. little spaces. Right. So, I mean, and after this walked across America, you were like, I'm going to try this within my own city or? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it took a little while to, to figure that out. I came back to New York with no real plan or anything. I didn't know what I was going to do. And I worked mm -hmm. a couple of different, you know, I didn't want to, I didn't want to go back to that kind of desk job. Um, right. So I worked a few different odd jobs. I worked on a farm a little bit North of New York city for a little while. Um, And I was actually reading, um, I, I had heard of previously uh, a couple people who had walked every block of just Manhattan, you know, right. just the kind of the most populous yeah. of, the, of New York's five boroughs. Mm -hmm. And um, that had always fascinated me as a way to see a place. Because we always think about going to see the highlights of somewhere when you travel. Right. You, you, it's always about the highlights and the top 10 lists and the best, seeing the best. And I just love this idea of, not caring about what's best and just just treating everywhere equally um, right so that was something that had stuck with me for years and then uh, i just started thinking about the possibility of doing this for all five boroughs which is just mm -hmm. such an immense thing and like how could i live in new york for that long without a job you know how could i make that work financially and mm -hmm. so i guess i shouldn't spoil all the quote unquote surprises in right. the movie. But um yeah, but so you you know you'll find out a little bit about how how all that works and how the lifestyle works. Uh, but I finally just kind of figured out how to do it and took a little bit of a leap of faith and just started thinking that you know it would take a couple of years probably and here I am nine years later. <laughs> with with still more more roads to travel. Still a little bit left. Yeah they keep building new ones. Well yeah that's, I guess that's what really gets you. <laughs> You that's think you finished thing. walking a neighborhood and then there's a new park there and a new street next to it. Right. Yeah. No, I mean, well, for those who, who haven't watched the film, you should. Uh, there's one more screening on the 10th of October. But um, I mean, the, the, the remarkable thing about this is uh, Matt does it quite sustainably in a sense that, uh, you know, he has a certain small, but you'll find out in the documentary, but there's a small budget and he finds certain ways to, he doesn't have a house. Um, and, and that was a conscious decision of, uh, you know, not having to pay a mortgage and, and figure out ways to to live with friends and, and all that. So you get to see a lot of uh, interiors of New York apartments, <laughs> you know, and cats. cats, a, lot cats. Are, uh, yeah. a lot of cats. The Internet loves cats. Right? <laughs> it does. All the cat movies at the projector sell out <laughs> all the time. <laughs> okay. So, yeah, we should feature it in the trailer, actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So how, how did this uh, documentary then come about? Like, I mean, it wasn't, you didn't start off with a uh, documentary in mind. Right? right. Yeah. I have no, you know, experience with film or anything. Um, right. I just started, started this walk and um, I had a friend, Jeremy Workman, um, who yeah. he had, you know, we had just been friends for years. Um, I had actually met him because I was interested in one point at meeting the subject of a previous film of his, a guy right. who spent, his whole adult life um, documenting the history and the artwork in all the New York City subway stations. So he'd go oh. down in these stations with a sketch pad and he'd like recreate all these tile mosaics in his sketch pad and he'd make these beautiful handmade books um, showing you what the art looks like from right. you know, the early 1900s when the subway system was being built and talking about the people behind it. Anyway, so I had seen a film. His name? It's called uh, um, One Track Mind. One Track Mind. And they also that came out, you know, many years ago now. And then just recently, a couple of years ago, um, they put out a little, you know, in addition, Phil's the artist, in addition to the big books of history that he had been self-publishing, Jeremy mm -hmm. helped him get a deal um, to put out a book through, I think, 
I think it was Princeton Architectural Press, maybe. Um, right. A book called One Track Mind of just of his artwork, of his drawings of the subway. Right. Um, so that's cool. a more recent book you might be able to find. It's really breathtaking to look at. You just you can just understand how much care has gone into every one of these drawings. You know, you see every tile has been drawn there. Um, and it's really beautiful. So, um, so I wanted to. I was just interested in meeting Phil, <laughs> and so I I couldn't find any contact information for him, but I found the information for this director who had made this movie about him. Mm -hmm. So I emailed him and that's how Jeremy and I became friends. Right. Um, and so then, you know, years later, uh, I'm doing this walk in New York City and about two and a half years after I started it. So at about the point where I thought at the beginning, I thought, oh, I'll probably be done in two and a half <laughs> years. <laughs> I was not in anywhere close to that. <laughs> and um, he emailed me and he had he had just finished up a, a, another film that he had been working on. And so he was kind of thinking about what to do next. And he just said, Hey, uh, shouldn't someone be walk? Should, shouldn't someone be like walking with you and filming some of this? Um, so he started just coming out when he had some free time, you know, different mornings here and there. Um, so he ended up, you know, it was, it was just him. There wasn't like a big plan. There wasn't a big crew. It was mm -hmm. just him and his camera. And, you right. know, He'd come out for half a day at a time often, um, you know, a day a week, two days a week here and there. And he ended up shooting for about three and a half years. So we had right. hundreds, okay. hundreds, and 600 hours of footage by the time he was done shooting. All and condensed then, into 90 minutes. That yeah, must have been he, <laughs> but it ended up being a great, a great thing because he just had such great coverage of so many different parts of the city. By yeah. filming for that long, and because I don't have my own apartment, I'm always mm -hmm. staying in different parts of the city. Yeah. So that ended up being a great thing for him because, yeah. you know, if he shot with me three times over a week, I could be in three opposite parts of the city. Right. Um, so he ended up with just this amazing coverage of different parts of New York City that you never get to see in the same place. You know, I mean, as much as you see New York on film, yeah. it's such it's such a small number of areas that you just see over and over and over again. Yeah, and yeah. A, a cool thing about this movie, which I think was just a great, you know, it, it was cool for me to watch this film when he was done with it because it, it captured my own experiences so well. And a big part of, of the experience of walking New York is just being in awe of how big the city is and how many different environments are contained within it. From, you know, right. obviously we all see the skyscrapers, but, you know, mm -hmm. the forests and the marshlands and a couple areas even seem like they're kind of rural. Um, all yeah. of that fits within New York. And and it was really neat to have all of that captured on film and put in the same place in this movie. Right. But I mean, did, did having a camera follow you, like change the way people responded to you at all? Or, or did it Some, not really? Yes, yeah, sometimes yeah. it would. Um, I mean, again, you know, it was just Jeremy. So it's yeah. not like you had a crew, you don't have someone with a big boom right. microphone. And he didn't have like a gigantic camera or anything. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, people would see the camera, but we kind of just looked like two idiots, like, <laughs> you know, going around making some dumb home video probably. Um, right. I mean, some people, some people would think we were uh, were the news, we maybe we were recording something for the news or, sure. uh, but, you know, it had different effects on people. It kind of had some pluses and minuses. You know, some people who maybe were on the other side of the street and I never would have talked to them um, mm -hmm. were excited and they'd come over and ask what we were doing and that would start a conversation. Yeah. Uh, but at yeah. the same time, other people would be walking right toward me. And on mm -hmm. a normal day, I would have stopped and talked to them. And, you know, they didn't want to be on camera. They were having a bad hair day or something. So they would like cross yeah. the street and get away from us. So it had different effects on different yeah. people. Um, okay. But for the most part, you know, when you first see the camera, you're a little put off and then you start talking mm -hmm. to someone and then, you know, you kind of forget the camera's there. You can't keep all this in your right. head when you're having a conversation. So most people it would just be normal after the first five seconds. Yeah. But did, did you have an idea of what the outcome of the documentary was going to be? Or, because I imagine, I, I mean, you yeah. had no, <laughs> no purpose in a way. In exactly. Yeah, I had no purpose. I thought this was just going to be the most boring movie in existence. <laughs> yeah. 
Like, how could a thing of a guy walking around be interesting? Um, yeah. But, you know, I had just become aware that um, there were just lots of interesting things happening to me while I was walking. That, you know, if if you look at my blog, it's just all stuff that I see that I take photos of and I'm telling you what I learned about it. But you don't really get any sense of what it's like to walk around. You know, the experience of walking, right. you don't understand that at all. So I knew that that it was just cool things were happening, you know, just in terms of people I was running into. And, and all of that was just going completely unrecorded. Um, so I just thought it would be interesting to have someone film some of that, even if, mm -hmm. you know, at the beginning, there wasn't a plan to make a movie. He was just thinking, like, someone should be capturing this. So I yeah. thought at worst to walk around with me for a month or something. And then, you know, we'll have some video of, of the walking and maybe that would be kind of cool. So, yeah, there was really no plan or direction ever. Um, and yeah, Jeremy is just, yeah. Yeah, I'm always amazed with, you know, documentary filmmakers because you don't know what's going to come out of this. You know, I'm just taking my camera and going yeah. and then having to edit. And But, I mean, it was great that, you know, there were a lot of themes that came out. And, and what, what I liked about it was it wasn't just about walking, but it was, you know, the people that you were meeting right. and, you know, nature and all that. Um, yeah, Jeremy so, is really great at... Um, he, he doesn't get hung up on like having a plan and having right. to figure out how this scene's going to fit into this. He's good at just kind of letting things flow. And he's mm -hmm. also a really great editor. He's like, yeah. you know, he has a, he has a, um, a company that makes trailers. He's probably made, made oh. trailers for, for different, you know, independent movies that everyone there has seen, you know, he does a ton mm -hmm. of trailers. So he's really a master, like his most specific skill set is taking right. a lot of footage and condensing it and finding the heart of something. Yeah. So he okay. was kind of the perfect person to do this film. Um, right. And so he just kind of let things flow and just recorded whatever was there. And mm -hmm. he started, you know, seeing a structure early on, I think, even as he still had years left of filming. And so he actually was editing during the filming process. You know, he was filming mm -hmm. for years, three and a half years. And probably six months in, he was already edited. Right. So okay. he was just good at like kind of seeing how this st structure would take shape, but also being open to it changing and and mm -hmm. how things in the future might fit in. So he started right. seeing those themes that you were talking about, where it's not just mm -hmm. about walking, but he started seeing those early, but yet was was also open to them kind of evolving and changing and maybe being replaced right. by other things later on. What, what, what was your response watching the documentary? Like, um, I mean, I, I thought it was great. I mean, I couldn't believe that it was a, an interesting film. Like, I, I right. don't know how he did it. And it's especially like, you know, it's always horrible seeing yourself on camera, right? Like, we're all aware of this now during the pandemic. I, we look, we I feel the same it. way right now. You know? Yeah, exactly. It's terrible. So yes. um, a nice thing was that, like, you know, I wasn't involved in the editing of the film other than right. making a few suggestions here and there. But a nice thing was that because we were so close and we were friends from the beginning mm -hmm. and uh, Jeremy always says that he was kind of interested in, in making this film with me, not just about me. That's the way he right. puts it. So he would show me things early on. So it was nice. Cause I got like, I got it in small doses. It was like, here's mm -hmm. five minutes of you on screen and you can get used yeah. to how terrible you look and how <laughs> stupid you sound. And then by the time I saw the whole film, I was over right. that and I could deal with how stupid I look all the time. And so <laughs> then I was able to just appreciate the qualities of the film instead of thinking about how I look and how I sound and how right. big my nose and whatever. <laughs> Yeah, no, fair enough. I've until now, like I, so I haven't done a lot of this stuff too. But because of the pandemic, we've been doing all these virtual conversations. And every time you know it comes on on Facebook, I still cringe a bit. But yeah, you know. they talk about how like more more people than ever are having plastic surgery now because they see themselves <laughs> on camera all the time. Yeah. So they like, oh my god, I look terrible. But I want to yeah. tell everyone out there that we all look terrible, and you know right. you're beautiful. Who you are and don't change it. <laughs> oh, we've, we've got a question for, from Madara who thanks you for the film. And if you could share um, some of the most interesting characters or stories that you, I mean, it, I know it was uh, what, seven or eight years now, but uh, yeah. was there anything that stuck in your, in your mind? 
Man, I mean, it's such a like avalanche of memories and experiences over these years. You know, it's like yeah. it's hard for anything to, to stick out in particular. I mean, you obviously see a lot of a lot of great. Um, you know, I mean, Jer so Jeremy filmed, like I said, six hundred hours, but right. you know, I mean, that's a ton, but it's also a pretty small percentage of what happened, you know, over all the years. And there was a time early on where like, like one day I remember, for example, he was, um, it was, it was in January. So, you know, it was very cold out and he filmed, you know, from the beginning of the day up until lunchtime. And then he had to go, go to work. And so he left and like 20 minutes after he left, um, I'm walking down the beach in Brighton beach in Brooklyn. It's a, a neighborhood mm -hmm. where a lot of, um, Russian immigrants live. Yeah. And I'm walking down the beach. Of, uh, What's that? Oh, the vodka, the vodka bars yeah. on the beach. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Um, so I'm walking down the beach on this very cold day, and this guy walks down the beach and he takes all his clothes off and he runs into the ocean. And <laughs> he comes out, and I'm just like, "What's that all about, man? It's cold out here." And he's this Russian guy, and he does this every day of his life. He comes wow. down to the beach and he runs in the ocean. He comes out and he was like, I mean, he was like a 70 year old guy. And he yeah, comes out yeah. and starts doing push ups on the beach, you know, without putting any clothes on. And so, you know, I'm thinking, oh man, you know, I, I wish Jeremy had been here for this. He left just a minute too early. And so then I kind of get over that regret and I keep walking. And yeah. I'm still walking down the beach. 10 minutes later, the same thing happens with another guy. Another Russian guy comes down to the beach, takes all his clothes off, and runs into the ocean again. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe Jeremy just missed this. Like, this would be so incredible. And so I used to have the, that kind of um, regret, you know, feeling yeah. when he would leave and something would happen. But, you know, by the end of, of 600 hours of footage, you're not missing anything. You, the only problem right. is that you have too much stuff. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean, as much of an avalanche as he had to deal with in the film, it was even more so over the years. So yeah, there's lots of little little moments like that that are just, right. you know, I can't even think of them on an average day. It's only if a certain question comes up, then I'll remember that thing. Because there's yeah, yeah, just yeah. so many layers of, of experiences in there. Do, do you read your blogs? Do you go back and um, review your blogs at all? Or are you just looking forward to, in terms of what you're writing? And Yeah, I'm just looking forward all the time. Um, which, which was what made the film so interesting, I think, is that, mm. you know, my job is just to be here and think about what's here and think yeah. about the next block coming up. And Jeremy's job is to look back and reflect yeah. on things <laughs> and find those yeah. kind of patterns and themes you were talking about. Right. Um, so that was a really interesting thing about the film that was so different from the way that mm -hmm. I experienced the walk. Um, but I do end up just, you know, one of the things that's hardest to explain to people, but it's kind of one of the most profound things about doing this walk is, is how you realize everything is so connected to everything else. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, through the research of the city, I'll learn about this thing over here, but because I, I previously learned about these other four things, I start to understand these threads of connections between them, whether right. it's because somebody who did this lived over here or, mm -hmm. you know, this this subject is related to this. They were formerly an, an advocate for this subject before going right. to this. And I just saw a memorial to that subject over here. And all of these things in this kind of weird spa time space continuum mm -hmm. that we're in, there's all these threads of connections between everything. And it gets more and more dense with these connections over the years. Just yeah. like if you think about one of those I can't think of the title, the, the name of it, but like those social maps you see where, pe where they show how people are connected on the internet, yeah, yeah. Social, you know, it's like that. It's like these kind of crazy three dimensional mappings or four dimensional. How everyone's on connected page. to Kevin Bacon maybe. Exactly. <laughs> so anyway, so that starts to happen with all these things. Yeah. What seems like just one little thing, you know, so mm -hmm. I start researching and I realize this is related to these four other posts that I wrote years ago. So that right. takes me back to those to reread those. So now I don't really intentionally look back, but I'm often kind of sucked back into it because I come to realize that if I had seen this thing on the first day of my walk, I would have just, mm -hmm. it would have been a point in space and that's all it would have been. Right. And now yeah. it's this four dimensional thing connected through time and space. And mm -hmm. that's also what makes this research take so long because I'm no yeah. longer thinking and talking about just this thing, but now how it connects to all these other previous things. So I do right. in that way, I end up looking back a lot. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, but I, I mean, one, one thing interesting that came up also was how that walking experience, even though you may be walking in that same spot, it's so different between people. Uh, I think there was this uh, Jamaican writer, I'm sorry, I forgot his name, but Garnett, uh, that you Garnett walked, Cadigan. Garnett, yes, exactly, um, whom you walked with. And for him, it's so different an experience that he, he talks about how, as a, as a Jamaican person, that he needs to be so conscious about how he dresses and you know even how he walks and everything because and that's what his mind is preoccupied about because he wa doesn't want to have that sense of uh, criminality yeah. uh, whereas you know like when he was talking to you like for it, there was that you know freedom to actually just experience the space and not be so hypersensitive in a way um, yeah so to me that that was a very interesting and very poignant moment in that film and yeah i really appreciated that you know, Jeremy actually put it in rather than, you know, like, uh, I, I thought it was a very strong point within the yeah. film. Yeah, I mean, um, we knew that was, you know, something that we had to address, obviously. Um, right. I mean, you know, we see at, at this moment, especially in America, um, yeah. probably more so than ever before, that kind of thing's being talked about and more, more white people who've never really thought about their mm -hmm. safety in different areas um, are yeah. becoming more and more aware that, you know, people who don't look like us in America can have very mm -hmm. different experiences doing yeah. something innocent, just walking right. around, right. you know, that can yeah. be a, a very different experience for different people. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, I mean, I was of course always conscious of that. Just, you mm -hmm. know, when you spend enough time walking, you, you become aware of how people are perceiving you in different ways based right. on how you look. Um, but you know, the, the small number of people I'd met who really spend tons of time walking around New York were also all mm -hmm. white and they were also all male. Right. And so, you know, I had a sense that ex the experience would be different for someone else, but I didn't mm -hmm. have anyone to, to tell me the, the details of their experience. And right. then I met Garnett, who was the mm -hmm. first non-white male person I knew who, who like, not just walks in New York, but walks in all these different areas. And, you know, mm -hmm. New York is such a diverse place that walking in, in all parts of New York means you're going to be spending most of your time walking where you don't look like the other people who live there. Right. <laughs> and so he was the first black guy I knew who mm -hmm. did that, who went out into all these different areas and who just had all these firsthand stories of what happened to him in some places where I had had no real experiences, you know, right. where, where it had just been kind of a normal day for me, he would get threatened or, or people would, you know, pull their car up on the sidewalk to tell him he shouldn't be there. Um, right. So, so there's just a big difference between understanding in concept that things are different mm -hmm. for different people and having someone mm -hmm. say, here's what happened to me in that right. same place where you were. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, once I met Garnett it was like, you know, this guy is, is a perfect person to, to deliver this message. And, and maybe help mm -hmm. other other white people understand that right. that it's not just a vague concept, but like yeah. here's a person who it's very different for him than this guy you're watching this movie about. Right. That to recognize that privilege in a way of you know you just being able to to do this whole thing for eight years. Um, yeah. So yeah, I mean yeah. I, I appreciate that. Um, but what's what's happening with you now? Like, yeah. So um, about six months ago, I guess was when you know, everything kind of blew up <laughs> in the world. Um, and so, uh, you know, my way of, of finding places to stay in New York was kind of upended. You know, my couch surfing, right. my cat sitting, people stopped traveling. They didn't need people to watch their pets anymore. <laughs> and so all of a sudden this, you know, lifestyle that I had lived for eight years was kind of not possible anymore in New York. Right. Uh, so I, I'm now in Virginia. This is where, where I, I'm in, in my parents' house. This is where I grew up. Uh, so I've been down here for about the last six months, um, just kind of waiting it out until a time where I can get back to New York and, you know, make my, my kind of lifestyle work again. Um, so yeah, it's been, it's been pretty interesting going from doing this thing for eight years. It's just all about paying attention to what's around you, wherever you are. It's all about, you know, forgetting the highlights and just, you know, just really appreciating what's there and kind of mm -hmm. taking that perspective back to this place where I grew up, you know, spent the first half of my life and having that new 
perspective on a place that seemed familiar. And now, you know, of course, I've I've seen and learned more about you know, about Ashland, Virginia, where I grew up than I knew in my entire life up, up until the last six months. Um, so it's been really, really cool um, kind of understanding how, you know, the walk in New York, it's not really about New York. New York's just where it's taking place. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, no matter where you are in the world, if you start, you know, looking under things, wherever you go, looking behind things, paying a little more attention to things, the whole world just opens up to you. I mean, it doesn't matter if it's a giant city or you're out in the middle of a farm field somewhere. Um, it's really not about the place. It's just about the, the attitude yeah. that you have. So that's, yeah. that, that's been cool. Yeah. Yeah. So that, that's exactly why, I mean, we actually programmed this documentary as part of um, Archifest because I mean, you know, now with, with no travel also like the whole idea of how, you know, everyone is kind of rediscovering their own neighborhoods and, and finding things to do and, and all that and for us we really felt that yeah i mean you know like don't talk about having cabin fever or being stuck at home and you know there's so much in terms of just stepping out and walking and, and rediscovering the communities around you rather than you know like i need to get to bali or, or whatever it is like, uh, yeah and you know we know yeah. how i mean obviously being outside in the open air is the the best way to deal with this virus right so it's in a way it's a great time um yeah and you know, I've I, since since the pandemic started, I've heard from a number of people who've started walking every street of their own town or their own city. Right. Um, yeah. But I haven't heard from anybody in Singapore yet. So you guys no. better get on that. I want to. I want somebody to start. I, I gotta know. I don't know what Singapore looks like. I gotta see. I, I was actually contemplating that. <laughs> you know, because really, I mean, you know, you know how you were going around looking at all this uh, barber shops with the uh -huh. Z on it. Yeah. So in, in Singapore, like you have all these condominiums with the D, like a French D apostrophe. Oh, kind of that's a good observation. <laughs> and, and it's really bad names. Like, um, so, <laughs> so I've always like, yeah, I should go around documenting, documenting all this building. You and, should, you, you know, know, as soon as you like notice something like that and you start photographing yeah. it. I mean, as soon as you have yeah. 10 or 20 photos, just just at the start, right. all of a sudden it, it's something. Yeah. It's this collection. You, you yeah. start seeing patterns in it. Um, right. Yeah, you should totally do that. I mean, just start <laughs> in the neighborhood. That's all it takes. Because once yeah. you start marking on the map where you've been, mm -hmm. even if you just start in your own neighborhood, like once you see it growing, it's like, right. oh man, I got to keep doing yeah. this. Like once you can visualize it that way, it's really, really cool. And then you get into this obsessive spiral. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Who doesn't love obsessive spirals? Right. <laughs> All right, Matt. Uh, I think we're, we're a bit out of time, but thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, for for those for of you who me. joined us for this chat, uh, there's one more screening for uh, The World Before Your Feet. That's on the 10th of October at 5.30 p.m. at The Projector. Um, and otherwise, do check out the other movies that we have at theprojector.sg slash Have a good evening. See you. Thanks, Matt. Right. Yeah.